Clyde Hertzman, who is an epidemiologist, in other words, somebody who studies the incidence of health and illness in large populations, um, and he's also a physician, and he's going to make the case that you are something about the relationship between the genes you were born with and the environment with which your genes have interacted. So you are the product of that interaction. Please welcome Clyde Hertzman who will answer tonight's question, who are you, by arguing that you are what your genes experience. Clyde? So the title of my talk is, You Are What Your Genes Experience. When many people hear this, they think, oh my goodness, here's another one of these genetic determinists who's going to say that it's all the secrets of who we are locked up in our DNA and it just sort of lives through us. And I'm not here to say that at all. In fact, the new discoveries that have occurred over the last half a dozen years or so are showing us the degree to which our genes do not operate on their own, but that we are in a constant interplay between our genes and our environment, and that the environment can change the way in which the genes function. My basic idea that I'm here to put forward is that we understand now an awful lot more about how our DNA works than we ever understood before. And what we've come to understand now is that our DNA, our genes, are not some sort of a blueprint which then go on to print us out as people and to simply determine what our lives are going to look like. Instead, the DNA is in conversation with the environments where we grow up, live, and learn. And out of that conversation back and forth come a number of emergent properties. And some of these emergent properties, such as our cognitive development and our social and emotional development, are basic capacities that go on to shape the opportunity to create an identity of the sort that we're here to think about tonight. This slide here um, shows you southern Ontario divided into uh, a number of uh, neighborhood areas. What it shows is that from the least vulnerable to the most vulnerable neighborhood across southern Ontario, there is literally a 17-fold difference in the fraction of children who are behind where we'd like them to be on their language and cognitive or their social and emotional or their physical development by the time they reach school age. Now the reason that this occurs early on in life has got to do with the fact that there is a very dense network of sensitive periods in brain and biological development early on. And as I'm speaking, a number of these competencies are being laid out on this graph, where the gray part of the graph divides into the lighter, uh, whitish color at the transition to school age. And so what you can see is, starting at age zero, going up towards the beginning of school, there's a dense network of competencies that are emerging in early life. When we say that there are sensitive periods in brain and biological development, what we're saying is these are periods where exuberant growth occurs in brain cell to brain cell connections as a result, largely, of the quality of environmental experience that you get during that period of time. So sensitivity means sensitivity to the environments in which you grow up, live, and learn. And so when you look at what's going on with the visual systems, one of the key things that's happening at that time is that the child who has uh, a consistent set of adults up close at their focal length at within 13 inches have a chance to develop the visual substrates for imprinting and understanding that human beings are themselves, another to under understand that we are the same species as the people around us, and to start to emotionally decode what a smile means and what a frown means. And as you can imagine, understanding where you stand in the social world and being able to conceive of yourself as a human being is fundamental to identity. Language has a sensitive period throughout the early years, and in this period of time, children's development of receptive language, what they understand, and expressive language, what they can say, goes up pretty much as a straight dose response with the number of words and the variety of words that are spoken directly to them per unit time. So that over the first five years of life across North America, we have a 30 million word gap which is to say that the child who has had the most language spoken to them in the first five years of their life has had accumulation of 30 million more words spoken to them than the child who's heard the least. 
And with that difference goes the ability to understand and to express. And with the ability to understand and express goes the capacity to form concepts of the self and others. And then finally, by age three and four, what's starting to happen is early experience is starting to shape our executive functions. In other words, what we focus on, how we interpret it, how we make decisions, and so forth. Such that children who have grown up in chaotic, threatening, unpredictable environments tend to develop executive function systems that are hyper-aroused but have difficulty with focused attention. Whereas children who grow up in environments which are calmer and more predictable and safer have an easier time mounting a focused attention response. And what that means is that they have an easier time developing in a, a knowledge-oriented world, a world which asks us to engage in focused attention uh, sorts of tasks. And so by the time kids reach school age, a whole series of things have occurred which are either capacities or incapacities that are boundary conditions for developing an identity in our society. What happens in the early years continues to influence things irrespective of experience that comes thereafter. It doesn't mean that what happens in the early years is the only thing that matters. I'm not here to say that identities are formed by age five and that nothing else can matter. But I am here to say that we have direct evidence that these early developmental competencies, the social, emotional, the language and cognitive, and the physical, have an enduring influence and therefore have, ought to have an enduring influence on our identities as well. We have evidence, not so much from questions of identity formation, but from other areas that show the ways in which these things uh, persist throughout the life course. And so by the end of the um, second decade of life, things like school failure, unwanted teenage pregnancy, and criminality are influenced independently by what has happened early on in life, independent of the influences that come thereafter. By the third and fourth decades of life, things like obesity, elevated blood pressure, and depression have an independent influence from the early years. Other things matter after the early years, but the early years of that can still be seen. By the fifth and sixth decade of life, you can see the influence of the early years on things like heart disease, diabetes, and other chronic diseases. And by uh, later in life, you can see premature aging and memory loss being associated with the early years as well as things later on. And I have a note to myself, now that I'm approaching the end of the sixth decade of life, to uh, re-edit this slide. <laughs> <laughs>
and given them a task that requires them to focus their attention on something and then watch to see what goes on inside of their heads. And the main thing to notice here is that on the left, when you average over all of the kids from the green zone, there is a sharp notch in that black line at the bottom at 0.3 uh, seconds. And on the right hand side, you don't see the same notch. That notch that you see there, that's the focused attention notch. In other words, by the time these kids are in transition to school, we are seeing that their brains function differently. That in fact, the kids who are coming from the environments of low vulnerability are able much more easily to mount a focused attention re uh, response than the kids from the other side. Now you might be thinking, uh-oh, that sounds like genetic determinism to me. Well, it's not. You should know that in three months of of basic, a training program that they developed at the University of Oregon, you can produce that notch on the right hand side. But you have to do it at the right time. Epigenetics refers to persistent and heritable alterations to uh, the DNA, to our, our genes that involves changes other than actually changing the gene sequence the way in which uh, a mutation would. So this has got to do with things, chemical uh, processes, metabolic processes, whereby things sit on top of stretches of DNA, and as a result of that, can turn those things on or off, can make them express more or less. So as you can imagine, every person has one genome of DNA, but we can have many epigenomes based on things being upregulated and downregulated. Now we've always known that that must happen because uh, early on in gestation, uh, brain cells have to become brain cells and blood cells have to become blood cells. And because they all have the same DNA, something has to turn on and off stretches. But until recently, it was thought that that only happened when organ systems were differentiating. And then after that, it was stable. And now we understand that a large fraction of our DNA, maybe as much as a quarter to a third of it, can remain active throughout our life courses and, and can be turned on and turned off uh, by experiences that we have. These are two butterflies that come from sub-Saharan Africa. One of them has a tendency to stay in the shade and not do very much and the other sort of flits around and is very active and so forth. So what? Here you are out on election night and here's this character telling you about <laughs> butterflies in sub-Saharan Africa. Well the so what of this is that until the genome could be read, everybody thought these were two completely different butterflies. Turns out, however, they are the same butterfly. Genetically, the same. The difference is that one of them was in the cocoon during the dry season, the other was in the cocoon during the wet season. That's it. And look at the difference. The genes by themselves are not enough to explain this remarkable variety. So with that in place, then, we've started to look at this in humans. And we've looked at it in relation to stress and nutrition and lifestyle. It's been looked at in relation to identical twins diverging over their lifetimes. And we've looked at it in relation to things like maternal care. One of the things that we've been doing is looking at people in middle age who have been followed since birth, so we know their entire life history. And we can look to see whether or not we can see what we call epigenetic marks. In other words, systematic changes in the epigenetic patterns in their DNA, gene by gene, according to what their early life experience was. And so, for instance, on the 1958 British birth cohort, in other words, these were 17,000 children born in England, Scotland, and Wales during the first week of March 1958. 45 years later, when we were able to harvest fresh white blood cells, we were able to look for the epigenetic marks of their early experience. And what we see is as many as 1,250 genes express themselves differently according to the socioeconomic position that the children were found in during the first seven years of their lives. That's a full 6% of the genome expressing itself differently as a result of that early experience. The next one has got to do with whether or not your mother smoked during pregnancy. This is collected back in 1957-58 when these kids were in utero. And there you can see nearly 800 genes differentially expressed 45 years later on 
as a, uh, following this difference in exposure. And then finally, based on, in this case, retrospective reports of abuse, physical, verbal, or sexual, 1,141 genes differentially uh, uh, affected in terms of methylation. So what's starting to happen? Now that we have these technological capacities and the forms of interdisciplinary groups where epidemiologists like myself and cell biologists of the sort that are brought together under C pro programs can work together, we can start to understand how profound these uh, relationships are and the degree to which early experiences can land and can stick on our DNA and change the way that they operate. So the final one I'm going to talk about is something we've been doing recently, and it's very interesting because of the level of precision we're starting to get to. Now we're talking here about epigenetic marks that we can see at age 15 in relation to very, very finely calibrated data collection early on in life. And to make a long story short then, what we discovered was is that mothers, but not fathers, stressors in the first 18 months of life are showing an epigenetic mark that persists in, well into the second decade of life on at least 100 different genes. Yet, in the preschool period, when the kids are 3, 4, and 5, it gradually switches over so the father's stressors are starting to get under the, the skin and influence children's epigenetic marks more so than the mother's. Right? It's a very, very interesting way that this is played out. Uh, following the kind of thing that if you wanted to caricature it, you could see where the caricature would come from. So we're in early days with this work, as you can see, and it's going to take years, if not decades, to sort out how all of these mechanisms go. But what I'm here to leave you with is the following idea, that basically there is a quality of identity that feeds into what Irene has spoken about and what Alex was speaking about, which has got to do with an emergent property of how genes are basically in conversation with the environment at all levels. So there is the individual developing child in the middle, middle, as you can imagine, who is surrounded in a certain way by the family. But these broader environments are playing into the resources and the opportunities that are brought to bear on that child. And those things have the chance of getting under the skin and influencing who we are and who we become. Thanks for listening.